my name is Dolan Cummings. I'm an associate fellow at the Institute of Ideas, and I'll be chairing this session, which is also a kind of pre-book launch of Josie Appleton's book, Officious, The Rise of the Busybody State. Josie Appleton, the author of the book, is the founder and, and director of the Manifesto Club, which campaigns for freedom in everyday life. I think she'll explain what she means by that one when she talks about the book. Um, we'll then have responses from uh, Max Wayne Cowie, who's deputy director of the think tank Respublica, from Mark Littlewood, who's director general of the Institute for Economic Affairs, a uh, more libertarian think tank, and finally by uh, Dr. Jan McVarish, who's a researcher and lecturer at the Centre for Parenting and Culture Studies at Kent, and the author of this book, Neuroparenting, The Expert Invasion of Family Life. So uh, I'll ask Josie to outline the themes of the book for around 10 minutes before inviting responses, and then I'll come out straight out for questions or points from you. If you wanted to hand out leaflets in Basildon today, you'd have to pay £350 to get a licence, to be a licensed leaflet distributor. If you wanted to play music in Camden, you'd have to buy a licence, which would have all sorts of conditions, uh, including what kind of instrument you could play, where you could stand, that kind of thing. And there was even a Cambridge pub that they wanted to have a poetry reading, and the council told them they needed a, um, a spoken word licence. <laughs> um, you know, I think that really the, the kind of extension of the licence form into everyday life in, in that way really means that more and more of the things we do um, in public spaces, in pubs, in, pri in our private life, um, go through some form of um, official uh, sanction. And there are new crimes, which is really the, the crime of unauthorised action. You know, so, so the crime in Basildon is to hand out a leaflet saying, come to my play without having your licence, to play uh, your guitar without having your licence. The crime of unauthorised action, which means that the crime is not to harm somebody, to cause an actual kind of... Um, uh, to public harm, but merely to not have permission for whatever it is uh, you're doing. And there's been a rapid transformation in, in towns and cities uh, across the country. Anyone who has done anything in public space over a period of time will recognise um, that 10, 15 years ago you could go and put up a stall in a town centre and pitch your thing, you know, uh, campaigns um, or, or an art event or whatever. Now you would get approached within a matter of minutes and asked to move on. You know, maybe they would say... You don't have a license, you don't have a charity collection license, uh, your store doesn't have a risk assessment, which is the case in various parts of the country. So essentially the way in which public space and, and relations are constituted has really, really changed. There's a new um, state infrastructure and kind of system of, of law, regulation, surveillance, um, which has no content except to be turned against the free act. So it's not as if the policy or the rule has its own rationality. Um, its only uh, rationality is that it's against anything that's free, against anything that's unauthorised. That's the crime of unauthorised um, action. And I think this, this bureaucratic infrastructure is very different to previous forms. Um, you read Max Weber on, on bureaucracy and what bureaucracy is supposed to be about, and it's essentially all about um, efficiency, public function. Bureaucracy, he said, started in Mesopotamia and Egypt with, with the canals and the distribution of water. It's essentially about performing a public function as efficiently as possible. Obviously, other, other versions of, of, of regulation and bureaucracy have been that they represented a particular class interest, which you see very much when you go to a London park and you see all the lists of bylaws at the centre, at the, at the entrance that say no washing clothes in the fountain, no grazing your uh, horses, no eating the wildfowl. Um, basically, it, it, the, the laws in the 19th century were very much about disciplining working classes, saying... Uh, you know, the park is for wandering around and chatting and not for um, washing your clothes and, and, and eating the ducks. Um, so, and obviously there's also a kind of public service role of bureaucracy in terms of dealing with inequalities, helping the less well off and that kind of thing. So I think that really if you look past, at past bureaucratic forms, there was always some kind of social function behind it, either a class interest um, or a, a popular interest um, or some kind of performing something that was necessary for everybody, distribution of water, um, in Mesopotamia. Um, I think that now you have a bureaucratic form and a form of regulation that is completely arbitrary and without any kind of social content. It doesn't really represent anybody or do anything. Um, you look at, see this when you look at kind of policy documents um, for, uh, for example, a touch policy or a child protection policy for a sports group. And you look through the document, there's actually nothing in there that makes any sense from the point of view of protecting children from abuse. There's, no, there's not actually a targeting um, of abusive action. Uh, um, it's, it's really about targeting the free action. And the only point of the policy is to make sure that the, things, the way that people conduct themselves is in a regimented, uh, regulated manner. 
and simply that they do not use their common sense, that they do not act spontaneously, but that they act according to a series of, of stages and rules. So they might say, oh, you know, you can, you can touch children, but only above the shoulder, or only lightly. Um, or you can take photographs, but only uh, at the end of the play, only of your own child, or only headshots. Or have these kind of, um, kind of specific uh, requirements, or you have to get a, a parent photography license, which some children's sports groups do. You have to get an armband and wear it and show that you're a licensed parent photographer. And it's not exchangeable between uh, parents, so mum and dad have to get different, different licenses. Um, so I think that really the, the, the point of that is obviously it doesn't have any productive function at all. It's merely to say that just pitching up as a parent and taking photos is implicitly criminal. Um, just using your own judgment about what to do um, when a child can't get home after practice is implicitly criminal. You have to follow step-by-step -step procedure. Um, and I think that the, the kind of the logic of this new, offic new officious regulation um, uh, relates to a new kind of official, which we increasingly come across um, in the streets, uh, in, in work, in, in, in institutions, and voluntary organizations. Um, you know, the kind of busybody character, uh, which is not really about those individuals' characters at all. I think there's, there's a kind of certain discourse saying, oh, he's interfering, meddling officials, and that kind of thing. Um, it's not a consequence of their characters and individuals, but it's more the social structural position they occupy um, uh, which is as part of a new form of form of state, and these officials are, these officials are quite unique, um, you know, not very much unlike uh, the, the policeman or the gendarme or the kind of um, the haut fonctionnaire or the high high kind of bureaucrat of the past. Um, firstly, they they seem to lack qualities; uh, they don't really have a uniform in many cases. Um, you can't really tell where they're from or who they are. Um, uh, they wear a black fleece, maybe, uh, have a camera, uh, a badge, a clipboard. You know, these are sort of new, new, new forms of, 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 of symbol, which basically they're not part of institution. Really, all they represent is um, the authorized person. It's a person who's being plucked from the crowd and given a badge and given power over people. So they have no content other than their detachment from people and their power over people. Um, which is very different to the classic police, you know, when the formation of Metropolitan Police, it was all about drilling this individual into being a member of the institution. And they would have really tall hats, like so tall they could hardly hold their head up in certain cases. It's basically about market saying, this person does not represent themselves, they represent, um, they represent the institution. An institution and not a man, they said. And they lined them up and drilled them and, um, you know, very much a, a disciplined um, uh, representative of state authority. And the new officials kind of slouch about, you know, they kind of don't really know what they're doing, they might interfere with you, they might ignore you, they might be having a chat. There's a kind of randomness to them. They're given three to five days training in some cases. So certain people have fining powers after five days training. Um, they can fine you for a criminal offence, which means you have a criminal record, which will come up on, on, a, on a, a vetting, a CRB check or DBS check. So there's, a, there's a, the, 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 the scheme that gives this power is called the accredited person scheme. And really, this is really very indicative language. It's basically saying it's a person who's been accredited. And they're not representing anything. They're just representing bureaucratic authority. The fact that they're not like everybody else, and they have power um, over them. So I think this is quite unusual that essentially the, the mechanisms of bureaucracy become separated from any kind of social um, content. Um, and it's really, I wouldn't see it as bureaucracy per se. And certainly, if you look at things like criminal justice, you actually see the unraveling of, of bureaucratic mechanisms of the old kind of things that Max Weber said a bureaucracy should be. You're seeing the absolute unraveling of that. So for him, uh, you know, a police force uh, should always be about strict lines of control, hierarchy, public function, um, not giving out badges to anybody who then waves them around. Um, uh, you know, the kind of the loss of logic to, 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 to the officious um, busybody, something that very much represents the unraveling of classic bureaucratic forms. Um, and you can see this with the way that in, in criminal justice they talk about um, a power or a law being a tool. And, and they sometimes say it, it's a handy part of the toolkit, or it's a flexible tool. Um, and this is basically a power to find someone or to take them to court or even to prison. Um, but they talk about it as a tool. And that really, the word tool really shows the way in which the coercive mechanism, mechanisms of the state have become detached from any particular purpose or function. It's more just like it's something in the toolbox. It's defined by what it allows an official to do, 
uh, um, rather than um, what it's supposed to be used for. So it's just like, you pick it up, should I use a spanner or a hammer? You know, I'll, should I give them a dispersal order or, um, you know, an on-the-spot fine? Or this is all very nice and free and easy and got lots of options here. Um, but essentially the mechanisms of coercion have become detached from any kind of social or political logic. And so they're used in this sort of open-ended um, way according to the whim of officials. Um, and really what this means is you get a kind of reversal of balance, the balance between state and society. So from the assumption that everything's permitted unless it's banned, you, you get the opposite, which is basically everything's banned unless it's permitted. Um, and rather than the idea that state power should be restricted and curtailed and that civil society is, is open-ended and free, you really get the notion that state power should be open-ended and free and civil society should be restricted and curtailed. So the, the pursuit of new powers, not only from, by the police and new officials, but also by public bodies, is seen as the quintessential public service in a way. So whenever there is um, a problem or a dispute, and the, idea, the, creation, the creation of new powers is, is the option. So essentially, the, the answer is always that extension of the domain of, um, of, of the volition of, of officials um, and the restriction of domain of civil society is seen as, as what it means to uh, be, a, be public and to respond to um, a public dispute or, or, or problem. I think what happens increasingly is officious mechanisms start to mediate the relationship between people. Um, so any kind of um, dispute or, or, um, or argument, or it, often it, it goes through some form of legal or coercive form now. I've got a report out about the use of community protection notices, which are essentially on the spot ASBOs, um, which allow council officials to write on a form what an individual has to do. Uh, and if they do that, then it's a crime. So they could say, uh, some of these involve things like, you must clean your windows, um, you must cut your grass, you must not allow your peacocks to roam through the village, um, which actually the peacocks are incredibly popular as local uh, petition camp, even demonstrations in favour of the peacocks. But, and uh, in, in some cases, you must not shout. And there's a very disturbed man in, in Hackney who, who shouts in public. You know, you must not shout um, in public, as if as if this kind of bit of paper is going to um, going to solve the problems that he has. Um, you know, I think that the, basically the, the resort often to any form of um, a public need, a public problem, is, is a coercive mechanism. Um, even the village in the Forest of Dean is currently trying to ban, ban sheep from the village uh, because some of the incomers um, didn't like the sheep poo droppings and said it was, um, didn't like the smell and the sheep sometimes nibbled their hedges and that kind of thing. Um, but essentially you had something that's actually probably run-of-the-mill neighbourhood dispute, but now the council is bringing through a PSPO public spaces protection order, which will make it a criminal offence to have your sheep um, in, this fo in the Forest of Dean village. So it's actually something that, that, that would have been negotiated among neighbours or different groups in a village, or essentially is mediated through the coercive mechanism. One part public gets an order served on the other and criminalises um, the other. And indeed, to kind of be a, a sort of public-spirited person increasingly means that you seek these um, bans or, or kind of... Um, forms of regulation of other people. Um, and I think the most striking example, just, um, just as the last example, is, um, is, is the, the role of um, consent kits and consent forms in um, universities. And you know, the fact that um, in the most intimate moment in many ways, it becomes mediated through a form of third party um, impersonal authority. So the question of demonstrating consent um, becomes uh, essentially an artificial question because it essentially means that you demonstrate it through the form specified in the policy and not um, to another person. So you're essentially demonstrating it to the official and not to the other person. So it involves things like saying it in words, which is the weirdest thing, um, that you say everything in words, um, or taking a photo with the consent kit um, in some American colleges. Uh, you have to kind of take a photo at various stages to, to show. And, you know, I think that, um, you know, essentially the, by, by turning consent into this um, into this kind of uh, official form, it means that even at that moment, then your relationship to another person is mediated through third party authority and with the implication, not only of very artificial forms of comportment, but also um, of, a, of a conflict of interest um, within that relationship that one, that, that one or other party is being defended against the other. Um, so just finally in conclusion, I think that this, 
the situation, this development of a new form of, of, of regulation of infrastructure of, of state form really creates an objective potential for a conflict between, um, between uh, the state bureaucracy and, and um, civil society. And I think that in various ways you see different groups who are defending the domain of their free activity, whether that's students walking out consent classes, um, sheep commas in the village of Dean um, protesting at that, against that, the, the people um, defending the peacocks, um, or, uh, or, or saying that homeless people shouldn't receive a fine um, for lying down or sleeping in a public space as, as they currently can in certain towns and cities. And I think that really this, this is a potential alliance that is defending the, the domain of free action within civil society against a, a form of regulation that has been detached from all groups and doesn't really represent either left or right. I think that a lot of the old divisions about the left would be for regulation because it's kind of helping... Um, the poor and the right will be against it. I think those, those divisions are no longer apply and actually the groups who encounter the frustration of regulation, um, of this new form of regulation, are from every domain, every group in society. Um, and so I think that really, um, you know, the potential for building those alliances whereby um, it's not that you defend one group's right but then um, protest against another, but, but, but actually see that there's a principle here, which is a, a line between state and society, which to all intents and purposes, has been lost. You know, when I talk to people in the Home Office, when I, also when I talk on ro local radio, there's no sense that there should be a domain of free activity um, that, um, you know, that if you're not hurting anyone, you should be able to do what you want to do. People, you know, on local radio, I've had people saying, oh, you can't have people lounging on benches. You know, basically, you can't... <laughs> it's like, well, they're lounging. Um, or or councillors say, well, I'm not a big fan of um, pigeons. It's like, well, I don't either, but should an old lady... <laughs> be criminalized because she is a big fan of pigeons. I think, you know, I think that the kind of the notion of all principle in terms of the domain of state and the domain of civil society has, um, has gone. So I think that implicit in these conflicts, there is a reinstating of that principle. And that's, um, I guess, what I'm, what I'm trying to do with, with, um, with work on this area. I'm now going to give each of the other speakers a few minutes to respond to Josie, to raise any disagreements in particular or different perspectives. Do you recognize this picture of a new form of regulation? Is it as much of a problem as Josie thinks it is? Um, would you defend it or would you critique it differently? Max. Thank you. Well, I'll, I'll be very brief. I've got a couple of points. Um, I'm, actually, I'm a big fan of the Manifesto Club and of Josie because um, I'm a deeply complacent and lazy person. And so I don't naturally, when something only minor, kind of has a minor inconvenience on me, I don't naturally extrapolate from that to what it might be like for other people or indeed for me in the future. And one of the things the Manifesto Club has been really successful at doing, and this book is very successful at doing, is outlining actually how things kind of develop and escalate and grow. And I think that's a really important part of this. So I might not particularly mind, as has happened to me on multiple occasions, that kind of strange people come up to me in pieces, as you mentioned, and charge me <coughs> inordinate amounts of money because I've dropped a cigarette up on the floor. Um, I might not, not particularly mind that because I might think well, I shouldn't be such a prat about doing that, but actually the connection that has to the relationship that we have between individuals and the state, I think is profoundly important. I think one of the things that comes across really strongly, actually, is, is the way in which we sort of nationalise the clip round the year. And we've kind of gone, actually, because... I mean, I'm a Tory, right? So I, I believe in natural uh, authority, and, and, and I'm big on authority and that's very good, and it should, should be there in society, otherwise we'll all fall to chaos and we'll end up stabbing each other and eating each other's organs. And um, uh, the collapse in natural authority, I think, in our communities, and the collapse in a sense of identification with the other people who live around us, and the role of preacher, priest or teacher or whatever it might be in being able to uh, educate other people in how they're expected to behave in the public sphere, has fallen away. I think that, 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 that is the case, and I think that we have panicked. And we have then insisted on inserting a whole layer of bureaucracy or, or, or kind of officialdom into that to try and replace some of that natural authority. Um, the problem is that that becomes self-degrading because now we don't trust anyone who isn't wearing a high-vis vest. And so if someone comes and says, you could just stop doing that, please, or that's not a nice way to behave, or actually that's not, you know, could you do something with your sheep or your peacocks or your whatever it is that you're, you're messing around with in the Forest of Dean, we go, well, who are you to tell me? Weirdly, that's also then made us much less suspicious of the person who happens to have a walkie-talkie and a high-vis vest on who comes and tells us that we need to do all of this stuff or we're going to be in trouble. And we just kind of accept that authority because we think, yeah, there must be some sort of source for that um, that's really important. Um, I also think, by the way, and this is not, you know, the, the debate I was just in was about kind of Europe and European Union and divisions, etc. and a lot of people were talking about immigration. I think one of the problems that kind of genuine mass immigration has caused in our society what has been part of in our society 
is that we have got quite fearful of the idea that we're surrounded by people who might not know the rules. You see it kind of like, you know, people getting really frustrated about whether or not people know that they're supposed to queue at certain points, etc. And that's quite natural, I think. I think it's important to people that in collective shared space, you have a, a, an idea of, uh, or a sense of confidence that most other people participating in it know the rules. If you don't have that confidence, I think that you do start then to become kind of slightly wimpy and whingy. Because um, you either are going to be the sort of person who says, no, no, you must do this like this, because that's the way we've always done it here, in which case someone will film you on their mobile phone and put you on the internet. <laughs> or you go and you ask someone who's official, someone who's official can do it, so it's a TFL person, or it's, you know. Um, and I think that that is part of the, the issue here. My final point, this is a, a really interesting conversation to, that we all need to participate in properly. Um, but my final part, I suppose, is, is, is also around, um, uh, so all these people, I'm really struck, as I keep saying, all these people who have been in, in, given all this authority in different sorts of ways, and it's all very difficult to understand and mediate, but nonetheless we appeal to them. Part of the issue, though, I think, is the way in which we seem to have become ever increasingly hysterical about needing to understand who owns what, right? Who owns what bit of public space, and how is it managed, and who's in charge of managing it? And so you get these kind of, they're like Peronist kind of descommissados of, of, of the privatised public space. And they work for companies, but they also are empowered by the state, etc. And actually, even you know, speaking as a as a as a Tory, this is this is this is exactly the, the, the worst outcome of the kind of political economy that we've helped create in this country. Because actually, we've kind of allowed for a privatisation of authority and for a kind of weird uh, blurring of the lines between what the private sector gets to do and what the public sector gets to do. And actually, I don't want to be policed by the people who happen to own more London. I want to be policed by. The Thanks, Max. Uh, Mark, yourself. Well, I think I agree with Josie a lot on the, um, on the problem. What I'm interested in exploring is what's the reason behind it, the, the trend behind it. What incentives, from an economic <laughs> point of view, are these people facing? How might you combat it? I'm slightly sceptical about Josie's suggestion, but I have one or two of my own, in which I'm not wholly confident, but I, but I think might fly. What's the reason for it? Well, I share the um, Josie's um, horror at intervening bureaucracy, but I probably don't necessarily share her love of public spaces. And as Max has said, I think behind this uh, is part of a problem. Let's take one area of heavy-handed regulation over the past 10 or 20 years on aspects of unhealthy lifestyle. If you smoke cigarettes, drink too much, now, if you want to, you know, potentially buy a can of Coca-Cola, you'll be taxed on it more heavily than previously. There is a certain justification behind this, and that is that we are all coercively involved in the state endeavour to provide each of us with health care from cradle to grave at the expense of the taxpayer. And if I am paying for your health care, uh, I have an interest in how you are behaving. And if you are smoking 60 cigarettes a day and drinking 12 pints of lager and drinking lots of coke and stuffing his face full of hamburgers. Pretty much my lifestyle, actually. But if, if, if you're doing that, uh, I'm bearing the cost for it. And this suddenly now legitimises my interest in your affairs because I can legitimately say that I am picking up part of the bill. For as long as you have, in areas of our lives, coercive public provision of certain services, in this case, health care, I think you are going to have a prima facie a justification for these sort of interferences. I don't know the specifics around, say, Basildon or Camden that, uh, that Josie mentioned, so I'm hypothesising. But uh, I'm imagining that litter collection in Basildon Town Centre is paid for by the Basildon Council tax pay. So if Josie wants to go out and deliver 100,000 leaflets, of which 20,000 are dropped on the ground, and I am a Basildon taxpayer, uh, she's chewing into my council tax contribution. However wonderful her leaflets or the play that she's promoting or the peacocks that she wants to march through the streets of Basildon may be. <laughs> uh, so again, if there is collective, coercive public provision, be it for litter collection in Basildon or uh, your treatment for lung cancer or arthrosis of the liver based on your behaviour, it seems to me actually we've got a problem because there is a prima facie justification for these sort of interventions. My solution privatise these things rather than have them in the public domain. What about the incentives that these people face? Now, again, I can't speak to the particular incentive of the community leaflet liaison officer at Basildon Town Council, but it 
does seem to me, across our civil service and those who act to enforce regulations, we have deliberately set up the wrong incentives. Uh, let me give you an example, an example that may not actually uh, cause such problems once we finally left the European Union, but if the background incentives are the same, we're going to have similar problems outside of the European Union. And that's on the sort of gold plating of regulations and legislation. If you are a senior lawyer working for the government and you are concerned that a piece of government activity might be out with European Union law, your career incentives, absolutely explicit career incentives, is to ensure that the British government is never infracted in the European Court of Justice. Never. What sort of legal advice do you think you are likely to provide to your minister and people in that department? unbelievably cautious legal advice, unbelievably restrictive legal advice. Your career depends on the EU not infracting us in the ECJ once. So you are going to copper bottom gold plate any advice you give. I suspect that is the same for the Camden noise pollution officer, who will be judged in some way on whether the number of neighbourhood complaints about noise has gone down. And he is therefore incentivized to make sure that each and every pub is basically not playing music at all. Why would he do otherwise? Uh, that's what his career relies on. Uh, so I think that we've got a problem with the provision, public provision, state provision of various services and amenities, which lends itself to this argument that we all need to be interested in everybody else's lives. And I think we have set up bad incentives for bureaucrats, enforcers, and regulators. I think this is also bleeding into the private sphere, however. I don't think privatising everything is the total solution. I was pretty, pretty furious that, uh, as somebody who consumes nicotine in virtually all of its guises, uh, chewing gum at the moment because the state prohibits me from smoking in here, um, e-cigarettes. Uh, I'm staggered that you can't smoke e-cigarettes yeah. in most pubs or football stadiums. I mean, it's actually incredible. Uh, I've followed my football team for 35 years. Believe me, at half-time, you need a cigarette if you follow my football team. Uh, I've been called up several times for smoking an e-cigarette in the stadium, completely harmless to me and everybody around me, and I sort of protested about it. Why? Why, Why on earth is this bad? I mean, oh, well, it's the rules. It's on the regulations. On the, that, that's not a why. That's just a how. Why is it bad? I said, well, you don't, don't worry about that, they actually said, I'll tell you what, we'll open the back door for you and you can slip out and actually have a proper cigarette. So uh, Southampton Football Club are actually um, incentivising me to use carcinogenic substances to get my <laughs> nicotine intake rather than entirely safe substances in, in the stadium. So it bleeds into the, the, the private sphere as well, this officiousness. How to combat it? I would love to believe in Josie's view that we could have some sort of grand coalition of smokers, drinkers, buskers, peacock fanciers and everybody else who might be sick and tired of the way that uh, officials regulate us. I fear there is absolutely no sign of that emerging, in fact. It seems to me that uh, consumers of alcohol are not disproportionately sympathetic to consumers of tobacco uh, and consumers of Coca-Cola are not uh, disproportionately sympathetic to consumers of alcohol, uh, despite the fact that in these cases all of them have uh, faced punitive taxation. But there's not been some grand coalition against taxation. People have fought their individual battles, and therefore the official and bureaucratic state has succeeded in divide and rule. And to misuse that sort of poem, which is about something far worse than just official bureaucratic intervention in our lives. And first they came for the smokers, and I said nothing because I wasn't a smoker, and then they came for the drinkers, and I said, nothing, I wasn't a drinker, and presumably by verse 27 they've come for the peacock collectors, and there's nobody left to defend you. So I'm not sure a grand coalition can easily be put together. Uh, my suggestion is this, is to name and shame the bureaucrats, to uh, actually use social media, other tools, possibly even an organised campaign, to ensure that these people... Uh, whether they're in high-vis jackets or in anonymous black places, uh, have their activities publicly recorded and are called for account for what they have done. And the reason that I think this might be successful is that the one thing that bureaucrats loathe is any form of publicity about them. And I'll recount an anecdote. I won't say who told me this anecdote. He was a senior advisor to the previous government. I won't tell you the department. 
but he was saying when they got their media cuttings in each morning, the response to headlined news stories that something had gone horrifically wrong, that hundreds had died or that thousands and thousands of people were falling below standards was a shrug of the shoulders, well, well you know, that sort of stuff happens. The response to three lines in a diary column that someone had been called out for their expenses not being in order caused absolute hysteria. That was the stuff that the bureaucracy couldn't respond and react to. So my suggested way of fighting back is that we actually need to personalise the beast that we are fighting against. At the moment, it is an amorphous blob. But the minute it becomes Bill Smith who's doing this and Jenny Bloggs who's doing the other, that this is filed, recorded and publicised, then I think their incentives change. Uh, then I think you actually start to see human discretion used in a human rather than in an inhuman way. And perhaps, just perhaps, we can turn the tide away against the sort of mania that is afflicting virtually every single lifestyle choice we take and enveigling itself into virtually every area of our lives. Thanks very much. Thank you. I found Josie's book really useful and I thought that what it first made me try to do was to see whether there was some kind of parallel with my area of concern, which is how the state operates in our private lives. Um, and I thought Josie's book starts with this characterization of the warden or the person with the power to issue a license who has the police, the clipboard. And I was trying to think, is there some kind of parallel in the way in which the state operates in the private sphere? And the, the one I came up with was the health visitor. Um, similarly, the health visitor arises late 19th century, early 20th century, um, in, with the task, really, of trying to sort of civilise uh, working-class families, working-class families who were seen as uh, chaotic, uh, offering inadequate, inadequate care, primarily through a kind of lack of hygiene, uh, were, went into working-class communities and working-class homes in order to instil good practices of mothering, as they have become uh, known amongst uh, middle-class women. Um, through the 20th century, the health visitor kind of acquires uh, other kinds of roles, which... which have more of a medical expertise. They are trained nurses. Uh, they do accumulate a great deal of experience of an awful lot of kinds of different kinds of babies uh, and different kinds of, of parents uh, during their working life. What's happened in the, in the past uh, 10 years or so is that the recruitment of health visitors has doubled uh, as a priority with the, since the coalition. And the rationale for a doubling health visitor numbers was that they're not social workers. So whereas it's generally perceived that social workers are not trusted by people, and particularly the people who they are charged with policing, uh, and with the people whose homes they are entitled to go into, uh, sometimes accompanied by the police, health visitors don't have those kinds of rights. They don't have a right of entry into your home. You have to allow them to come in. Um, but in doubling the number of health visitors, the reason why that was done was because they were perceived as having a greater legitimacy amongst families than social workers currently do. What's happened to the health visitor is that they've now uh, been trained up in a whole other way of working, such that their priorities have really moved away from concern for the child to a concern with the way the parent interacts with the child. And although they may still do things like you know, make the case for immunizations, um, spot cradle caps, some kind of developmental delays, black feet, that kind of stuff, they still do know that kind of knowledge, um, and may well uh, still have the capacity to refer parents and children to specialist services. Um, actually, if you look at their literature now, the further up the list are things which really have got nothing to do with the child. So, for example, um, according to the NHS Careers website, health visitors promote healthy lifestyles and prevent illness. As a health visitor, they work in partnership with parents. And that's a very useful thing to bear in mind here, that the health visitor is now a partner with a parent. So just think about what that, that means. Because what it goes on to say is that as a partner, you will be assessing parenting skills. So is the parent involved in assessing their own parenting skills or are they being monitored here by the health visitor? You'll also be charged with, with assessing the family and home situation. And then the final bullet point is that you'll be assessing the developmental needs of young children. And I would argue what's happened with health visitors is a similar process to, to what's happened um, in the public sphere that Josie's talking about with the creation of these new kinds of public officials. Health visitors are increasingly told that they operate on the authority of science. They operate on the authority of what we now know about the brain. So in that sense, 
what they've, uh, the authority that they take is a very estranged authority. It's not based on their experience of many babies, uh, that generally babies are okay. They operate on the start, from the starting point that there is a fundamental parenting deficit in the UK, that we have very low breastfeeding rates relative to other countries. We have a problem with poverty and social mobility. So the health visitor is, is charged with rectifying these huge social issues, uh, not that breastfeeding is one, but that breastfeeding is prioritised because it is said to increase social mobility, um, and they lose sight of the individual child. They operate on behalf of the brain. The, ch the brain of the child becomes the third party. There's no particular expert. They're not experts in Dr. Spock. They're not experts in, uh, in medicine or in speech therapy or anything in particular like that. It's generally that they're charged with monitoring parents for the way in which they cultivate their children's brains. Um, there's a blurring of distinctions <coughs> across the kinds of institutions that parents come across, um, whether that's school teachers uh, becoming increasingly involved in what you feed your children, uh, whether that's the health visitor asking you about your relationship with your husband, is he supportive, do you think he's bonding with the baby? Uh, and there's a blurring of distinctions between charities, the state, uh, private companies, uh, and people who are now called uh, caregivers, who could be a teacher, a parent, or an early years worker, or a health visitor. And there's also this uh, relentless targeting of, uh, to formalise what were previously spontaneous uh, relations and interactions. So the way in which a mother chooses to sing to her baby or not, whether she chooses to hold the baby for <coughs> lesser or greater amounts of time during the day, whether she decides to co-sleep, breastfeed, formula feed, are now the subject of concern across the whole population of new mothers uh, to these officials, the health visitors. Um, and whereas in the, in the past we would have expected perhaps a greater degree of concern with families who were in particularly difficult circumstances, this is now a universal agenda of monitoring and assessment. Um, and it also relies on an estrangement from intuitive thinking, uh, from the idea that people may well just figure things out for themselves because babies generally survive and do okay in a normal family setting. So it's this kind of estrangement from normal practices. And just to finish, the, one of the points that came up in the last session I went to on populism, somebody made the point from the panel that nowadays to be radical, it's often enough just to reassert what used to be common sense. Uh, well, this is, this is where we're at in these kinds of operations, that you have this uh, denial and overturning of the capacity to even act on the basis of common sense or even to know what it is because you have this kind of expert discourse which intervenes. Really interesting. I wanted to ask you, Josie, about your thoughts on the relation between the process you're describing and the question of professions and professionalism, um, because I think that interaction is quite an interesting one. So say you take a place like a school. I mean, the conventional authority source has been completely, like been a teacher, and is completely bound up with professionalism. I mean, whether or not, I mean, obviously loads of, you can say there are plenty of teachers who weren't very good teachers and what have you, but anyway, that's, that's the basic idea. Um, and that that um, acceptance of authority is based in an understanding that there are particular groups of people in society who've gone through specific training, um, predicate their authority in an understanding of a specific body of knowledge and so, so on and so forth, exactly the same with doctors, you know, whatever professions you want to talk about. If you look at the way schools work now, the blurring, I think, is really interesting. Um, so, you know, people who exert their authority over you as a parent, just as much as the teacher, is the lady in the office who phones you up and moans at you and says, actually, if you're not careful, you know, we're going to um, do something with you legally, because you haven't handed in the doctor's note that explains why your kids had a day off school, um, you know, because of the chasing attendance and attendance monitoring. Now, obviously, that isn't based on professional and any conventional understanding of knowledge. There's no root in authority. So, in, in terms of the process, like how this has happened, I wondered about that, and also wondered about the kind of interaction between the two, and how far this process you're describing, I think it relates to what Jan said about health visiting as well, how far it in and of itself further unseats and diminishes meaningful authority and meaningful professionalism. I think doctors are an interesting one. I mean, it's not just, you know, now special people whose authority only rests in the fact that they know rules. 
I mean, that's the only basis, isn't it, for their knowledge. I know the rules, and I'm going to tell you what the rules are. Doctors are doing this now as well, right? Telling you how much you should, you know, how you should behave. And then there's the checking mechanism and the oversight of doctors. So doctoring has completely transformed, right? Being a medical professional is not the same thing as it used to be. So I wondered if you could comment on that. So, so you've presented it in terms of the busybody state and civil society, civil society being the place where we can oppose the busybody state. But it seems to me we've also got a busybody civil society. And we couldn't even just say we've got busybody society rather than looking at it in terms of state and civil society. It does seem to me that uh, these things, and that's been pointed out already, are constantly ratcheted up in civil society. You take the example that you use with football clubs, with the armed man photographers. That's kind of mediated through governments, government departments, the FA, to local teams. So each stage can be ratcheted up. I've got a lot of direct experience of that myself. And you could also say elsewhere, in the case of student unions, really these things come through the ideas that are prevalent within civil society itself. So I just wondered if you could kind of clarify the relationship between the state and civil society, given the fact that many of the assumptions behind these trends are shared across both. Where, where does this fit with authority? Because um, I'm sure Frank Freddy brought a book called Authority, um, and it's all about trying to look at where authority comes from. And generally speaking, I think he and other people like yourself would defend the idea that authority is an important thing. Because one of the problems is that I think people who might defend the bus busker or defend, he should be able to put graffiti there, man, let him do that. They're kind of antisocial, some of those people. And it's a kind of, it, the sort of people that say, yeah, I hate CCTV, how dare you? And they're kind of, they're as me-ish and narcissistic as the people who complain all the time about other people. So it's a, it's a difficult one in terms of the question of authority when you're looking at this question. I wonder to what extent the councils have taken a leaf from private sector running their own spaces. I mentioned more London and places like Canary Wharf where they've basically been given free reign to add additional regulations, whether that's against photography or no cycling, or add a whole swathe of rules and marshals to try and sanitise their space. The councils are seeing that and saying, yep, yeah, we'll have some of that. I just wanted to talk about um, the busybody state and especially in relation to politics because, well, I'm, I come from Spain and I was there when the Goodbye movement happened and that was a massive, <coughs> uh, you know, people occupied the main square in Madrid and they, you know, it was, it was a massive um, deal in Spain and, um, I mean, I, I, I think it's interesting to think about public spaces as something that follows the socio-political context. So we have to think, you know, people, when, when some people want to recite poetry or do whatever on the street, they might want to reflect something that has happened in the political sphere. So, um, I mean, there, there is a, when you say, oh, th these things that happen in public spaces, they don't, they don't serve any purpose. And I think it, it has to do with power and, and it puts in question what power means and what, you know, the, the, how we um, legitimate power in democracy. Because, um, uh, so I, I, could, I couldn't understand when I, when I was a teenager and I was like think, seeing, because the, the whole thing in Madrid happened when after the demonstration people sat down in the square and then these people were taken out by the police. And my, my younger self couldn't understand why was that a crime to just sit literally on the square and just, um, you know, express an idea. So um, I think uh, the, the, the public spaces is a space to challenge conventions and ideas um, so is, that's a very important thing, and that's, I think that's one of the most um, dangerous things of uh, the busybody state. I just wanted to be devil's advocate. I mean, surely when Parliament decided on the uh, Criminal Records Bureau and, and these things, they did want to pr protect children. And when they decided that the house visitor should do all these things, they also wanted to protect children. Is that not more important? So I, I'm a researcher in the uses of data and AI in local and national government, and I'm interested in how this links to trends in those spaces. Uh, with tools of government and how to sort of tackle problems or not tackle problems, you've got some, some functions that detect problems and then functions that are designed to affect or actuate upon those problems. In the digital space, you have trends in uh, detection, such as reporting using civil technology. You, kind of Mark, uh, alluded to it with the naming and shaming policies. 
But you've also got things about people uh, reporting policies more, using their mobile phones, reporting on things they don't like, reporting on noise, people you know, lounging about, or so on. Um, and so there's two sides to that. And, on the, uh, uh, and, and people I've been talking to in, in European cities that are working in this space have been worried about uh, discrimination in those spaces because people are, who are used to technologies are more likely to uh, dislike certain kinds of action rather than others. And secondly and finally, uh, there's changes in the way that we're affecting uh, policy. So police forces are increasingly trying to optimize their work with some of these busybody officials to try and work out and delegate what actions are and preempt uh, spaces which could be uh, regulated more efficiently and optimally using algorithms, for example. Um, and I wonder how this, these trends, uh, you, how the panel sees these trends affecting the future and how we should respond to them as civil society or whoever else. In respect of... Uh Health and social care professionals um, adopting a more monitoring approach to parenting. Um, I think in part this comes from the hysteria that follows the serious case reviews. Um, so I'm just wondering whether in, in part we, we are not to blame for asking after each serious case review. Um, the two inevitable questions are, um, how could this happen and, and who's to blame? Just in answer to the question about how you regulate public spaces, on a point of information, the common law has always been able to do that. There's a thing called a breach of the peace. Mm -hmm. Now, the important thing about a breach of the peace is it's not a criminal conviction. All it is is, are you threatening somebody, or are you damaging their property? If so, you're, you're committing conduct like you do, right, to, to get yourself arrested and removed, and you'll never be charged with anything, because breach of the peace isn't a crime. So in answer to your question about how flexible you need to be, the true answer is actually the common laws had it all along, which really does answer, ask for me, a bigger question, why we need all of this monarchy on top of it. I'm from South Africa, where we have a violent crime problem, which is obviously very bad, but there are other privileges that you get in a society that has poor policing. For example, if you're on a long stretch of road and there's nothing coming, you can speed a little bit and you're not going to get in trouble. If you're on an empty beach and you want to make a fire or cook some fish, you can go ahead and do that and no one's going to do anything about it. So there are some privileges that we enjoy. So my question is, is there a relationship between how we treat authority in serious cases, like people who want to commit violent crimes, and how we interact with authority in terms of things like going one or two kilometers over the limit or singing too loudly as you wander around the street or something. And if there is a relationship, is it a good idea for us to make sacrifices to live a more controlled life in order to have the freedom to walk the streets at night by yourself and feel safe and that kind of thing? I just wonder what the panel thinks, quite an involved question, but to what extent um, this is a manifestation of uh, the feminization of uh, authority in society. Um, and uh, whether it's sort of big mother instead of big brother, what do you think of that? Well, I suppose I'll come back on the, the point about protecting children. Um, the question is, what from? And how do we conceive of the risks? And I think the problem that we've got is we have uh, a chaotic and uh, totally disordered sense of what risks children actually face. And that does then give rise to a chaotic and disordered response, uh, which is very arbitrary, uh, and it primarily locates risk with adults, adults in general, and parents in particular, which is ludicrous, isn't it? Because the people who are on the front line of continually protecting children is parents, every moment of every day, generally speaking, with a few notable exceptions. So the problem that, that we need to address is what happens when you inflate the sense of risk to such a degree that you then undermine the ability of those parents in general to do those acts of protection on a minute-by-minute -minute basis, on a daily basis, and, and how their judgment is affected by the idea that there's somebody else who may be a greater authority than they themselves in the way in which they raise their children in this, in this case. And I think when it translates into the public sphere, again, it's that, it's that reporting uh, culture. Now, I'm going to, oh, should I um, call the anonymous helpline because I've witnessed something? It's kind of call out culture, but really for cowards where you don't even do it at the time. You do that, you know, you witness something, you don't even know whether you think it's wrong or not. If you go on online forums, that's what happens all the time. You know, is, was 
I was my reaction wrong? Am I being a busybody? Should, what should I down? Oh, call the NSPCC, uh, dial a helpline, maybe tell the school, tell the health visitor. I mean, increasingly, what people say is rather than call social services, they say tell the health visitor because they see that as a less uh, kind of um, effective, in a way, uh, state instrument. But what they what they don't understand is what health visitors have now become, which is they're continually having to report upwards, uh, which can lead to very just as heavy an intervention as would always have been the case. Great, thanks, Mark. Uh, just to pick up on a, on a few points, uh, the sort of contentious point that making the floor was, but isn't this all very well intentioned? And I'm sure it is, at least in initial concept, but uh, Road to Hell paved with such things and all of that. And to take on specifically the gentleman in the front row, who was sort of, you know, the use of algorithms and data to improve things, and again, it's a perfectly well intentioned way of doing this. Uh, that you're, you know, presumably Basildon Council is trying to crunch mass data to work out the optimal level of the number of leaflets that can be distributed in the town centre. I think the problem here is we've got to uh, reject central planning in its entirety. Um, I think that technology and algorithms and our access to data can be quite a liber liberating experience, but its use by the state, however well-intentioned, I think can be quite an enslaving experience. And let's hear it for a bit of chaos and disorder, <coughs> frankly. Um, or if one's going to be a bit more optimistic, some spontaneous order. I think we should um, celebrate different roles and different rules and different regulations in different spaces. Uh, I don't really mind if some places are sanitised. It might be that there's a good number of people who want to go to sanitised, quiet areas, uh, in which case the market will provide sanitised, quiet areas. I'm a member of a private club on Pall Mall. God almighty, its private rule book is incredibly prescriptive. You have to wear a tie, you can't use a mobile phone, you can't have to bring in any paperwork with you, the list goes on and on and on. Uh, but it is designed for people who want a quiet, civilised atmosphere without phones ringing. That suits me, it's fine. Just around the corner there's a Starbucks or a pub. You can go there if you want something different. So I think we need to be in favour of variety, spontaneity, and different people taking different choices. Something that suits us might actually uh, exist in a few acres of space, and those are the acres that we choose to go and frequent. It might not suit other people. We might want a completely different environment. So let's hear it for a bit of chaos a bit of disorder and a bit of choice across London mm -hmm. and elsewhere. And just to finish on the lady in the front row's point about um, sort of the violent crime in South Africa and, uh, you know, being a bigger issue there, sort of dealing with rape murder and therefore perhaps not putting out as many beach fires as possible. My concern is that the workload of the enforcement agencies will just grow to cover whatever human activities are left to regulate. So I'm not, I'm not suggesting we've cracked the murder and armed robbery problem in Britain, but we're probably closer to having cracked it than the South Africans are. Given that, you just get displacement activity into litter collection, cigarette butts, barbecues, uh, and, and the rest. And I think that when you actually are seen to begin to solve some problems, I mean, a good example would be domestic fires, or even fires in offices, and are considerably less dangerous than they were previously, well then you should cut back the fire surface. It is mission accomplished. Because if you don't, these people will find endless other areas of our lives, however trivial, to regulate. In part, that's a success, but it also means that our lives do not remain free. All right. Thanks, Mark. Uh, Mark. Uh, very briefly, I think a lot of the questions come down to this uh, the fundamental question of authority and where does it spring from and how do we best kind of deploy it. Um, I think, to be I think we have become terrified in our society of any sort of informal power. And one of the reasons, talking about the well-intentioned point, I and mean, it is probably often well intentioned. We're terrified of informal power because informal power is messy, because it can discriminate, because it can treat people in ways that we think are unfair or unjust, because it treats people differently. But I would argue, and similar to what Mark was saying, we have to put up with that. Because actually, when we formalise authority and power in, in, in all aspects of our life, we create uh, these kind of long tail consequences that maybe aren't there otherwise. And speak to the point about AI and about algorithms, etc. Not an area that I know a vast amount about, but I think that speaks to exactly this same journey. I don't think there's anything new. It's a journey away from informal power to things that we think we can quantify and look at and call scientific. And I'm terrified of that. 
I really don't want to live in a society where determinism is taken to all new levels and is outsourced to some sort of mathematical equation that then tells me whether or not my behaviour is acceptable within a given space or a given place or a given relationship. And that's where I think it goes, because I think we're formalising because we think it makes it fairer and actually just makes it blunter. Yeah, I really agree with that point. I think self-regulation and, and the regulation of social context is very important. There are things you can do in, in Soho that you wouldn't uh, do in... I don't know, the most lubrious part of town, West London or something. Um, but I think that there's a kind of detachment from social context now where people sort of think that um, rules can govern in all places. So the people complaining about busking in Camden, they, they have a house on a busy crossroads in Camden town centre, and they can play busking um, in the night, in the evening, um, like seven o'clock in the evening. And, and so they complain to the council, and the council uh, prosecuted the uh, bee hopper concerned, um, who now has a criminal record crime of being popping without a license um, in central, central Camden. So I think that there is a kind of detachment from social context recognising this is a particular space, these are particular rules, um, and then obviously there's a certain this uncertainty, I would agree with the point of, of having a certain openness, you don't quite know whether the park's for children or for dogs, and you negotiate that, and the kids chase the dogs, and the dogs chase the kids, and I think there's a, you don't have to have a zone for one person and a zone for the other for the other activity. So I think that that, that kind of informality, where where both there is a, a particular social context, you can do this here but not there, but then also actually maybe when you negotiate the rules in this space a bit is very important. And old school authority is very important as well. Um, the bus conductor, the park warden, um, you know, people with with authority without power are replaced by the individual with power and no authority. And people often write to me, having been fined by um, one of these uh, black-suited chaps, and say, "I've no idea who he was. You know, I was like worried. He put me up to me, and I didn't. You don't, you don't know. It's not clear. You don't recognise them." And it's like, "Well, you were some kind of comment." And actually, one council, there were some comment who pretended to be these wardens, and they basically marched people to the cash point and uh, fined them for offences. And um, and the company and the, count, the council were really uh, outraged about this. But actually, they showed what actually these wardens are doing on a day-to-day basis, which is that. It is uh, their, their only function is is to, is to punish um, and to make money from that, and they will have targets and that kind of thing. So actually, these comments are doing exactly what the official wardens are doing, just without that kind of sanction. Um, so, yeah, sure. Uh, finally, um, I think it is not um, about public service at all. Really, I think I think that this is a, you can see a transformation and a conflict within delivery of certain public services where the officious strand is very much frustrating and going against the public service delivery aspect. So bin collection, for example, you get people taking away the bins, and other people uh, are analysing the contents of the bins to find out if you've got the wrong thing in the wrong bin, or if you leave your bin in, lid open a little bit, or putting cameras. So I think that there, there is, a, there is a two strands working against each other within public services, and that, that shift has been really over the last 10, 20 years, where, um, where, where you get that kind of conflict. Um, uh, developing. Um, finally, on what we can do about it, I think that there is, I would witness a radicalisation of people who experience these situations. And so, you know, an old lady was fined for walking her dog by one of these private companies on commission, completely humiliated by this, this chap, and she was you know, really radicalised by this, and, you know, very quiescent in lots of ways. But basically, the principles that she derived from that were actually principles of, of common law and freedom, and this has to be justified, and actually quite general principles. So I think I remain optimistic that. Um, that in the, these conflicts, something can be can be gained from them, both in terms of the way people experience them, but then also in terms of aligning those um, in, in, in a common cause. Thanks. Before we thank the uh, panel, let me say it's, it's been a fascinating discussion. So I'd like to thank everyone who contributed, also from the audience, and the fact that so many of you here suggests that Josie's hit a nerve. I hope you'll all buy the book. Friendly join me in thanking the panel.